Well, thank you, Jasmine. Thank you very much. Again, I'm David Troxell. I live in Sacramento and have worked in the field uh, of Alzheimer's and dementia care about 25 years, written a number of books in the field, but I think very relevant to this audience. Like many of you here, I've also been a family care partner for my mother, Dorothy, who passed away in 2008 with Alzheimer's disease. So uh, I've traveled the journey and happy to talk to you a bit about this journey and some of my own work around what I call the best friends approach to dementia care. I will uh, do my best uh, in this one hour format with our remote locations as well to uh, charge along and leave some time for questions. But particularly for the group here in Las Vegas, if for some reason uh, you can't get all your questions in, I'm happy to hang out for a few minutes and visit with all of you. Again, thank you very much for coming. So let's jump right in and we'll talk about not only my own work around what I call the best friends approach to Alzheimer's disease care, but, but in a sense also set the stage for what is quality dementia care today. I am very happy also just to do a little shout out to the Cleveland Clinic and the Lou Ruvo Center and the wonderful staff and volunteers here. I've known a number of the key people here for many years and just so excited that Nevada and Las Vegas have this amazing, wonderful memory disorder clinic, uh, research center, and volunteer programs serving our families. So thank you for your kind invitation. So let's jump in. How many of you have ever seen a picture of Dr. Alzheimer? He's the one who kind of started this whole thing off. He was working in Germany a little over 100 years ago. This was a time of great science. They, they had new stains and slides and microscopes. They were very fascinated back then by what they would have called lunacy, you know, what causes what they would have called madness or lunacy back then. And Dr. Alzheimer was one of these very progressive thinkers who thought there was a link between the brain and behavior, which of course we know is true today. So he was doing his work, sorry, a little tricky uh, thing, when he met this lady here, Augusta. And Augusta is certainly not the first person to ever have Alzheimer's disease, but she's what we would call the first person described as having Alzheimer's. She was only 51 in an odd twist of fate, a younger onset person. She was having a slow progressive decline in memory, thinking, and judgment. She even tells the doctor, doctor, I have lost myself. Now, if you look at her face, what do you think is going on for her emotionally? Is she a happy person? How would you describe her? Depressed, sad, lost. I think she certainly looks a lot older than 51 as well. And you know, I'm going to put it out there today that this is a face of Alzheimer's disease even today. This disconnection, this loss, this, this, this loneliness, uh, depression. But the contemporary view of Alzheimer's disease and these other dementias today is that this doesn't have to be the face of dementia. There's a lot we can do to lift the person up and have them operate at their very best. So just to share a few reflections on my personal journey, I began working uh, in this field in the 1980s at the University of Kentucky Alzheimer's Research Center. Back then it was one of just 10 federally funded Alzheimer's centers. It's where I met my longtime friend and colleague and co-author Virginia Bell. She was the social worker, I was the health educator. And Virginia had started one of the first adult day centers in the country. And way back then, you know, we didn't really quite know what we were doing. We, we, we really weren't sure how the idea of getting a group of people with dementia together would go. We viewed this day program as, in many ways, just strictly respite or a break for the families. But much to our surprise, the people would come to this adult day center and they would have quite a wonderful day. There was something about the center that created what we would call a therapeutic environment. And a therapeutic environment is simply defined as an environment that's healing. I know many people here in the uh, audience here in Las Vegas are in the assisted living uh, 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 situation, or maybe you work in adult day center programs or even in-home. But this idea of an environment that's therapeutic is an environment rich in activity, music, exercise, relationship, and it lifts people up and helps them do their best. Again, this idea that almost accidentally, back in the 80s, we started this day program that caused, creates this therapeutic environment. And sadly, uh, in fact, Dr. Cummings, who uh, you know, is our wonderful leader here at Cleveland Clinic, 
uh, when I attended a conference here a little over a year ago, uh, Jeff Cummings, your neurologist and the head of the center here, I hope I have his title right, um, Dr. Cummings pointed out how tough it's been that it's been well over 10 years since we've had a new FDA-approved drug for dementia. And even worse, between 2002 and 2012, I think there were roughly 250 unique compounds, Dr. Cummings mentioned, that they studied for dementia, a multi-billion dollar effort in research with the private sector, pharmaceutical companies, the universities, uh, NIA, and the failure rate of this 10-year effort for this enormously huge public health crisis was basically 100%. So we, we are still in, in a world of hurt when it comes to dementia care resources, and that's, and that's why we need to really focus on how do we give this quality of life for, for our, our friends and family members with dementia. Now, back then, a, a friend of Dr. Cummings, Dr. Marksbury, was my boss at the University of Kentucky. He passed away a few years ago. But Dr. Marksbury was one of the top neurologists in the world with research, and it was very interesting. He came to the day program. He hadn't visited. And he walked in and said to me in Virginia, you know, guys, I have about 10 minutes. <laughs> and that was his big visit to our adult day program back then. And would you believe he stayed for two or three hours? He danced the hokey pokey with Elna. He served ice cream. He played beach volleyball. He read trivia. And this is this very prominent guy, very busy guy. Many of the people in that center were his own patients. And when he left, he said to me, my God, this is the treatment for Alzheimer's disease. So again, this idea of a program rich in activity being very, very powerful. We all know the impact of dementia. Uh, one slide just to put out there that this is really a, a, a runaway train or a train wreck right now when you think about the public health impact. Uh, there have been several studies in recent years pointing out that Alzheimer's disease and these other dementias are now the most expensive illness in America, more expensive than cancer and heart disease. I mean, stunning. It's the only one of these top 10 leading causes of death where we don't have, we don't have a, a really effective treatment. We don't know how to prevent it. And it's growing enormously in numbers. Uh, I had a chance uh, to go to China about a year ago and talk to some folks there. And in China, in 25 years, there will be more senior citizens uh, there'll be, in 25 years, there'll be more senior citizens than there are total people in the U.S. today. So it's, it's really stunning how this is a worldwide challenge. And since I was here a year ago, I'm sure many of you noticed. How's the sound? Do I need to use the, the, the handheld, or, or can you hear me okay? Better? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, in China, as I mentioned, they will have this enormous age wave. And how many of you read in the last few months that China has now abandoned its one-child policy? Well, let me tell you, one of the big reasons is this, is the aging population, the fact that with a one-child policy, you're not going to have enough caregivers behind that. So a quick word about this word dementia. Uh, Dementia is this umbrella term for any of these things that can cause this confusion and memory loss. It's kind of like the word soup, a broad category. There's chicken noodle, there's clam chowder, there's tomato. Every tomato is a soup, every mushroom is a soup, but every soup is mushroom. And just like the word dementia, that broad category, Alzheimer's is the leading cause of dementia, and there are many, many others as well. So most of us who work professionally in this field, we actually are running dementia programs. If the doctor says to you, your mother has dementia, you want to say, doctor, what is the soup of the day? What kind? And, and we want to know these different dementias nowadays. Uh, again, a few more words about kind of where we are today before I jump into quality of life issues. Uh, many of you I know are aware of Aricept, Exelon, Razodyne, Nemenda. These are these four current memory drugs. They're all billion dollar drugs, and they're not bad. I mean, I'm not a physician, so don't take my, my uh, clinical advice, but basically my, my physician friends say, you know, these medicines really are, are easily tolerated, very, very few side effects. They seem to, in about a third of the people taking them, give them a nice boost up. Uh, they are recommended. They're typically done for people in the earlier stages of dementia. But the problem with them, and this is why I have that image there, they're kind of like jumping out of an airplane in a parachute. It slows you down, but you eventually hit the ground. 
Uh, psychotropic meds, there's been a lot of attention in recent years about the psychiatric medicines that are often given for behavioral issues. Well, the problem with these medicines, frankly, they don't work all that well and they have huge side effects, okay? Including a much greater risk of falling down. So basically, these psych meds uh, for aggression or dangerous paranoia, antisocial behaviors, they can make an enormous difference in some cases, but we want to evolve away from them whenever we can because ultimately we think hugs are better than drugs. What do you think helps this lady in South San Francisco when she's having a bad day in memory care? Syroquil or Sophie the St. Bernard? There you go, good answer. Okay. So in my own philosophy, what I write about, and I think it's so powerful to think about, is you know, what is the world of people with dementia like? You know, how must it feel to not always know where you are, what's happening around with you, to not be able to do the things you've always done? I know many of you have experienced it through your own family members. What, what do you think they're going through emotionally? Frightening, frustration. Confusion, sadness, yeah. I was at a building um, a few months ago in assisted living memory care neighborhood, and this very elegant, lovely lady was setting the table. You know, that was kind of her little volunteer job. And it was almost heartbreaking because she was just staring at the fork and trying to figure out does it go on the right or the left? You know, the spoon, the knives, something that she probably would have done just with rote memory, you know, years ago. And I remember thinking, well, you know, it must be exhausting, too, to have to run through a day where everything is three or four, you know, times harder, right? So what helps this person who's feeling lost? Well, I'm going to argue today that it is this idea of relationship about having a relationship with the care partners around them, the staff, and even having a family who are kind of pivoting and thinking about what the person's going through. Uh, when I feel sad, when I'm feeling disconnected, what cheers me up? Being with my friends, friends who are loyal, friends who, who are, are upbeat, positive, friends who know you well, know your preferences. I'm a big Starbucks person, as some of you know in the audience, so you know, for me, someone brings me a really good cup of Starbucks coffee that lifts my spirits right away. And, and I think the same is true in dementia care. What a person really needs is a friend to help them feel safe, secure, and valued. And as a family member, this idea of accepting what's happening is so powerful, right? So if mother says, President Eisenhower is doing a great job, what do we have to learn to say? Mom, I like Ike too. Not what's wrong with you, he's not the president, he's gone, you know. Um, I remember visiting my mother in memory care. My mother was always so upbeat and positive, but one time I walked in and she said, I am so angry with you, you're late, you're late, you're late, I've been waiting for you for hours. Now I almost kind of went to the dark side because you know when you're, when you're surprised when someone comes after you, you almost want to defend yourself, right? And I almost said, Mom, I'm not late. I always come at dinner. You know, I'm, I'm so upset that you would criticize me when I come every day, you know? But, but is it worth it ultimately to win an argument with your mom with Alzheimer's? I mean, to even try at one level almost reminds her of her, of her disability, right? So when she says, you're late, you're late, you're late, I've been waiting for you for hours, what's a good response? Mom, I'm sorry, oh my gosh, the traffic was terrible, I'll do better next time, I love you, right? So this idea of pivoting and beginning to think about relationship, very, very powerful. So my first book came out in 1995, uh, The Best Friends Approach to Alzheimer's Care. And again, I think if the book had come out a few years earlier, I, I, it might have been a giant bomb. I, I, I don't know. I think we hit the timing just right. Because the big book back then was The 36-Hour Day, a, a great book. But when you think about the title, I, I think it almost, again, kind of keeps you focused on all the losses. And even though dementia is a terrible thing, I think nowadays, particularly when we look at all the numbers out there, we have to learn how to travel this journey and hopefully as a caregiver, come out on top and feel good about what we've done. 
So again, this best friends philosophy focused on rethinking your relationship, developing empathy, knowing and using the life story, communicating, and creative problem solving. And much to my surprise, I just have to, since I've been here, I was here a year ago, how many of you saw the movie Still Alice, this wonderful movie that came out, Julianne Moore won the Academy Award. Well, much to my shock and pleasure, there's a scene in the movie where Julianne Moore is Skyping her daughter in Los Angeles, Julianne Moore playing this younger woman with dementia. Um, and to the left of her computer, right there on the, t on the movie screen, is my book, The Best Friend's Approach to Alzheimer's Care. So how about that? I've, I've made it to Hollywood. I've gone Hollywood. Very exciting. Yeah. So if you look at this slide, I think, again, this reminds us of kind of where we are and where we want to be. So for example, a few of you who work in assisted living, you know, you're going you're to have people move into memory care who are very much on that left-hand side. Some of you who are family members are going to have a mom or dad, a husband, wife, or partner on that left side. And, and this is just the way it is when you have a situation which causes this confusion and memory loss. It doesn't mean there aren't joyful and happy moments, but, but I think you're prone to this stress, this sometimes fear and frustration, worry and anxiety. Well, when we begin to kind of rethink the approach, rethink the relationship, give lots of compliments, put on wonderful music, kind of you know, do with them instead of always doing with, you know, for them, I think we begin to move people from left to right. You know, we can move them from isolation to connection, from worry to contentment, fear to security. I mean, all of these things. Some of you may have seen the Glenn Campbell documentary that came out a few months ago where Glenn Campbell was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, I think in 2009, and then did over 150 concerts. It was, it was remarkable, uh, a great documentary, to see him playing Carnegie Hall, the most prestigious artistic music venue in the US, but the night before, he can't find the bathroom in his hotel. So again, this idea of thinking about strengths, for him, music, he can still play, it's in a different part of the brain. So we want to do all of these things because when he's playing his music, uh, it's, it's extraordinary because I think it, again, helps him feel connected. Sadly, I was in Colorado just a few weeks ago, and uh, Glenn Campbell's wife was speaking and said that he's now uh, in assisted living uh, memory care in Nashville. He has very bad aphasia, he, the language is damaged. He, she said he doesn't really understand anybody anymore, he doesn't speak very well, and he can't play his music anymore. So again, the devastation of Alzheimer's disease, these other dementias. So real quick, um, I wanted to begin to kind of paint a picture for you of some of the people that I've worked with over the years and, and how we kind of move them from left to right, how we've used this best friends philosophy, how we've used life story work to reconnect the dots for them. So here's Patricia. And Patricia, uh, well, let me ask you, how do, how do you think she looks? Good. What do you notice about her appearance? What do you like about her, what she's up to? She's active, she's focused, she, she's wearing jewelry, she's accessorized, yeah. As my late mother, who was, uh, who was, whose parents were British, my mother said she looks put together, yeah, put together. And yeah, I think she looks great. She's actually a um, uh, very interesting lady because she was a wonderful, what I'd almost call folk artist. She loved to paint uh, pictures of African-American women with all sorts of colorful outfits on, really quite something. But actually, when this picture was taken, she, she was fairly advanced in her dementia. She would do these vocalizations, these, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And it was interesting, you know, because I don't care, you know, how patient you are, how calm you are, about 40 or 50 of those a day, right? And you're pretty, it's pretty stressful. It's pretty stressful. Well, we discovered that, you know, knowing her life story, trying to be her best friend, that she was actually very faith-based. She loved religious music, and of course she loved her art. When she was painting, and when she was listening to church music, no vocalizations. Again, maybe you can't do that 24 hours a day, but this is an example of creative care. Here's Harry, who is a dentist from New Orleans. And he was actually a, a Hurricane Katrina victim. It kind of wiped out his medical practice and his house. He moves as a fairly young person. I think he was in his 60s. He moves to his kid's house in Lexington. And at first, they just thought he was you know, shocked or 
the trauma of, of losing all of these things. But after a few weeks, they realized, oh my gosh, something's not right with dad. And sure enough, he was diagnosed with early Alzheimer's disease. Now, Harry was in our day program, and again, a robust, terrific guy. We knew he loved being out of doors. Anything we could do to get outside walking was success. He loved gardening. But let me just throw, how, throw a little example of how the simplest thing can be the difference between okay care and excellent care. He was from New Orleans. Do New Orleans people, or I don't know what the word is, New Orleanians, <laughs> do, they, do they like bland food? What do they like? Spicy food, yeah. Now, how many of you here love spicy food? Imagine what it would be like if you could never have it again. How would you feel? Very sad, yeah. Now again, you know, often in elder care settings, we kind of assume a lot of elders don't like spicy food. Maybe that's true. But for Harry, you see, we knew his origins. And when lunch came, if we can pull out that Tabasco sauce, you know, made in Louisiana, and say, OK, hello, Dr. Harry. Here is your Tabasco sauce, hot and spicy, just the way you like it, happiness, right? And again, he may not have had the wherewithal to ask for it. But this is why, in my own work, this whole idea of knowing someone's life story, their traditions, their personal preferences, very, very important. Here's Masaka, who was from Japan, a Buddhist. She had done the formal ritual tea ceremony. She spoke fluent Japanese. She loved it when we asked her to teach us Japanese vocabulary, uh, talk about this old traditional tea ceremony. And she was a Buddhist, and when she was stressed, we had a little bronze Buddha. If we put that in her hand, and she could hold it, peacefulness, right? Again, imagine if the staff around her didn't know much about her, what a loss that would be. So I'm not trying to in any way say that you know, the challenges some of you are facing are diminished, but the contemporary view of dementia is that people with dementia are really just like the rest of us, all the same needs, emotions, feelings, and we want to do our best to figure out the pathway for success and how to build on that. And with Masaka, many of these things made a huge difference for her happiness and well-being. One more, here's Larry. He was a retired librarian, and we found a bunch of old library books at a garage sale. Do you remember the Dewey Decimal System? I don't even know if they have that anymore. But we would say, you know, Larry, oh my gosh, the library shelf is a big mess again. Um, I think the kids have been here. Would you help us put it back together? And he would be very content, very happy working on that. Okay. Now, I've had someone say to me once, well, you know, David, this seems kind of artificial. Are you really being fair? You're kind of faking the library. Is this a good thing? And you know, my answer is that I think people with dementia, just like the rest of us, still have a need to be needed. And I think people don't want to do what they don't want to do. I think this gave him a lot of satisfaction. And yes, we were kind of staging it, but I think also it was something, you know, I think purposeful that he really enjoyed doing. I showed this slide last year because it is one of my favorites. I have a number of new slides as well in this presentation. But again, it, it reminds me that beneath this cloak of dementia is a person. Virginia and I, my, my, again, my co-author, I think we may still be the only writers in this field who only use real people. We get all the permissions. We have you know, boxes full of permission slips. We use their real names, real cities. And Rebecca Riley was a nurse educator who got Alzheimer's in her 50s in Lexington, Kentucky. We actually asked her to keep a diary. And I love what she wrote, I dislike social workers, nurses, and friends who do not treat me as a real person. Daphne Gormley, I showed a few of these slides last year. She was a younger onset person with dementia. She um, was a friend of mine in Santa Barbara, a brilliant lady. She had been a scientist on the Hubble Space Telescope. She had uh, been an optician. Here she gets Alzheimer's young. And, and her solution was to fight her own depression and sadness by turning to the arts. She'd always loved painting and drawing, but not had much time for it. So she, so she re-embraced that. And here's one of her pictures here, which I love. Um, lighthouse. And she said, you know, David, on the left is me before Alzheimer's, on the right is me after. And I think this is so interesting. What, what, is, what does it say to you, you know, the left versus the right? There's no, no wrong answer. You can all be art critics for a minute. 
What do you think she's trying to say about her before and after? One was organized and one's disorganized now, random. It's more interesting on the right. Sunset, yeah, the sun's there. Yeah, you know, I think you're kind of on to it. She actually kind of meant this to be a bit humorous. And she would say to me, you know, David, my spice rack used to be alphabetized, you know, that she, she would have everything lined up and now she can learn to let go of little stuff. It's fascinating to me, but in meeting Daphne, if you talk to her, she would say, I am a woman of science. You know, I'm not a religious person. And yet, late in her life, she began drawing religious imagery. So again, this idea of spirituality and dementia, I think she was looking for that spiritual connection. Very good contemporary programs now <clears throat> build in the spiritual. We want to know if someone was you know, a Catholic, maybe they're moving their hands or looking for their rosary beads. But not everybody's part of a faith community. And so we might want to know that someone defines their spiritual wellness by being in nature, looking at mountains, listening to opera, helping others. This is all, again, something we want to help the person connect to. And Daphne even drew the plaques and tangles in her brain, really quite something. Dr. Bruce Miller, who's a really phenomenal researcher at UC San Francisco, uh, leads a very successful memory care um, program there. He's actually studied artists who get Alzheimer's and people who've never done art get Alzheimer's and start doing art. And one of his theories is that early in dementia, people actually have a spike in creativity. So that's why, again, I, I do recommend arts and trying to expose people to the arts, going to museums. Again, keeping an adult, no, no crayons, please, unless somebody was a kindergarten teacher. I, I like to use like, adult materials and do collage and do very interesting art. So I'm just going to throw these all up here. I think you have the handout. And again, we don't want to take too much time today, but I'll just share with you that in many ways, I think quality dementia care is actually, dare I say it, pretty easy it, for those of you who work in this field. I think that if you can develop a trained staff with lots of love in their heart, if you can keep people active and engaged, to me, the idea of socialization being very powerful for people with dementia. Many of you in the audience are family members. You have someone at home. Uh, if, you, if you can get them out to you know, watch the, the kids playing softball, go for a drive, sit in the car and have an ice cream cone, listen to some good music. If you do have an in-home worker, have a lively presence. All of these things fight depression, support good health, keeping them physically active, very, very good. So these are all kinds of things that we try to do nowadays. Again, purposeful chores. Many people with dementia love it when you say, Mom, would you help me? Uh, I used to bring in uh, wrapping paper to my mother. I, I actually kept wrapping paper in her room, in her assisted living room. And I'd bring in different things. And I'd say, Mom, you know, my secretary has her birthday. Would you help me wrap the present? You're so good at this. And we, you know, do you want the blue paper or the red paper or the green bow? And this worked for weeks. I mean, I would bring in different things. I'd bring in the same thing, and we'd rewrap it, right? Uh, and it was going so well. But after about three months, my mom said to me with her British accent, darling, I think you're spending way too much money on your friends. So that kind of kiboshed that whole project, yeah. Um, learning and growth, you know, uh, I love uh, reading a, a, a newspaper article aloud, talking about it, discussing it. I remember a few years ago, I was looking at this newspaper, USA Today, which is always fun. It has lots of little factoids and surveys. And I was actually in memory care that day. And the, the survey was something like, 61% of Americans believe that there are other people in the universe. 30% feel that we are all alone, and 9% don't know. So I asked the group of memory care, how many of you believe that there are other beings in the universe? And you know, it actually kind of broke down the same percentage. And then we began talking about it. What would they look like? What would you think? And again, this idea of talking and discussing. I was in Oakland, California recently, and we talked about the Golden Gate Bridge and the history of San Francisco and you know, trivia. And one person even said that their grandfather had been a cable car conductor. You know? And then we even sang that old song, I left my heart in 
San Francisco, yeah. And, and again, this idea of having a class and talking about it. Maybe 30 minutes later, they forgot we even talked about the Golden Gate Bridge. But in the moment, they enjoy the experience of learning. So these are all good things we want to do. Exercise real quick. It's probably the number one thing that our science friends say might help delay the onset of dementia. Exercise is great for the brain. And if you have dementia and you're physically active, not only does that help prevent falls, but again, it's very, very supportive of good brain health. So get out there, exercise. Music, I've already mentioned briefly, but music and song lyrics actually live in a different part of the brain than words and language. So anything you can do to enjoy that music, Louis Armstrong, you know, uh, old standards, or even newer music, the Beatles, which is not, not even that new anymore. Uh, <laughs> but you know, playing music like that is, is very life affirming. And you probably have seen another very good documentary that came out last year called Alive Inside about these you know, iPod uses in, in memory care. I know my friends from Prestige are here, and I think you're doing the iPods now. And so we have a lot of cool things happening with music as well. And finally, I'll just, again, covering a couple things here, being out of doors. What's so great about being in Nevada is, by and large, I think you have pretty good weather. And um, people like to be outside. Being out of doors is sensory, it's spiritual, you get natural vitamin D. So I know you get hot weather, cold weather, but if you can build in a little outside time every day, that's very, very helpful. So a few quick highlights here before we wrap it up. Uh, communication. These are sort of David's bags of tricks, or bag of tricks here. I'm a big fan of lots of friendly and authentic compliments. Again, the world of the person with dementia is a tough one. Even if you're a family member having a very bad day, if you can say, Mom, you know, you look so pretty today in that pink sweater. Dad, I'm so proud of you. What a great doctor you've been here in Las Vegas. It lifts them up, okay? How much time does a compliment take? How much money does it cost? Exactly. And you see, part of it, if you're, if you're a CNA in a nursing home and your job is to help someone get a shower that day, you just take that one minute and say, you know, Bob, you look great today in that blue sweater. You know, oh my gosh, what an honor to be with you. And, you know, can't believe you're a former senator or whatever you want to say. You see, you take that one minute to build the connection if the person with dementia feels like they know you, they trust you, they like you, isn't everything going to go better? Even if it's your own mom. So you want to communicate well. Offer simple choices. Dad, do you want to wear the red sweater or the green sweater? Mom, do you want the salmon or the roast beef? It helps them feel in charge. Asking opinions. Does my tie match my shirt? You know, uh, maybe you're a young person. You might say to somebody, you know, Professor, you know, you're a, a retired dean from Berkeley. I'm so impressed, my gosh. You know, I never did finish college. Do you think a young person like me should go back to school? You know, we once had a great discussion um, in, in long-term care and memory care, and it was, the, it was a question like this. A friend of mine wants to borrow $100. Is it a good idea to lend money to a friend? And again, even to these life advice kinds of things. So let's do a quick survey. How many of you think it's okay to lend money to a friend? Raise your hand. How many of you think generally not a good idea? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, again, having that discussion. And one woman with dementia said, well, you know, dear, I think the answer is to just give your friend the money. And that way, you won't have to worry about ever getting paid back. So again, this kind of idea of the wisdom, all right? Uh, slowing down, speaking up, being present, very important. And I've already mentioned outdoor time. Music. I love the words of Dr. Oliver Sacks, who passed away this last year. Um, lots has happened since my time a year ago. Uh, Oliver has been one of the, a hero of mine. And he says, music evokes emotion. And emotion can bring with it memory. He brings back the feeling of life. It brings back the feeling of life, even when nothing else can. Okay, and life story. In my dream memory care program, staff would know a hundred things about each person. You know, mom likes to sleep in her socks. She loves cats. She spent every, every winter in Hawaii. She speaks Spanish. She loved politics. 
She likes her coffee with two sugars and two creams. You want, you want the staff to know a lot about your family member. For those of you who have someone at home, just, just take a little you know, piece of paper, dad's top 10 list. So if you have an in-home worker or maybe mom has to go to the hospital, you want people to know a bit about their personal preferences. All right. Again, for me, I love strong, black, hot coffee. You know, if I ever get dementia, they're going to say, David, I brought you your coffee, black and bitter, just the way you like it, and I'll already be on board, right? OK. Again, this idea of a best friend's philosophy, you know, what can I do to know and use life story, just like I would a friend? What can I do to offer encouragement, just like I would do with a friend? What can I do to communicate well? All of these things, I think, can help kind of create this nice connection that doesn't take away all the dark, tough times of Alzheimer's and these other dementias, but does help lift a person up and feel connected. I, I love these two ladies here. I remember the lady on the right, when I asked her, um, my goodness, what a pretty hat. She said to me, thank you. And I said, do you enjoy wearing a hat? She said, yes, dear. When a lady wears a hat, everybody treats you better. You know, and we had a fun conversation about it. And again, just this idea of a hat is probably very therapeutic, and I'm, I'm guessing they probably came from the dollar store or something like that. What it all boils down to in the books I've written is this concept called NAC, K-N-A-C-K. And NAC has a great definition. It's the art of doing difficult things with ease or clever tricks and strategies, helping us in those unstructured moments, OK? So it's things like humor, flexibility, patience, being in the moment, creative activities. Here's a great slide from a company in Napa uh, where they actually brought in grapes for the residents to crush, like the old winemaking grapes and winemaking tradition. And what this means, again, is that the best approach to people when they're having a tough time is to develop this empathy, kind of pivot as needed. And for family members, trust me, it can be very hard. It's hard to let go of the old patterns, right? But remember Albert Einstein's quote, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So if you're trying to always convince mom of something, argue, you know, I, I talked to a family member the other day, you know, I am so upset with my dad, I pay all of his bills, and he never shows me any appreciation, he just thinks that I am taking his money, right? Now, the more the son argues, the more the son fights with his dad, is that helping anything? You see, his dad thinks he can handle his own money. His dad doesn't understand why his checkbook's been taken away. So in talking about it, what we did with the son is, is help him evolve some of these ideas. So now he'll write out all the checks, have father sign them. You know, Dad, I have your accounts all ready for your approval. And the father kind of rifles through them, you know, doesn't probably even know what he's looking at. And the son says, Dad, if these are okay, point right, you know, sign right here. And the dad kind of scrawls a little bit, doesn't quite get it down too well. And he says, Dad, thank you so much. What would I do without you? This idea of the knack, okay, of, of changing things up a little bit. And, and ultimately, again, with dementia care, you know, more and more, I have to say, I, I, I'm kind of having been in this field 25 years, I, I've kind of gotten emboldened. I want to mix it up and try new things. I want to. I want to try uh, you know, to take people out to a softball game, go out to a movie, go out to lunch, you know, do different things to give people back this connection with life. And if you occasionally flop, if you occasionally fall on your face, that's OK. That's OK. Because again, you want to be bold, and you want to try things. I think we're forgiven if we make an occasional mistake, because ultimately, I love the words of Maya Angelou, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel, okay? And again, this emotional connection so often is there for people with dementia. Um, 30 seconds, many, many staff say, David, I love these ideas, you know, my gosh, but I don't have time, I don't have time. Mike called off and Joanna's on maternity leave and, you know, the chef's having a bad day and, you know, all this stuff. Life happens, I totally know. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I think with dementia care, and maybe even with life, too, it just takes 30 seconds to be a little less task-oriented, a little bit more person-centered. You actually take that time, and you save time. Sometimes, if somebody's having a beginning, beginning of a meltdown, you take even 5 or 10 minutes. 
20 minutes, you might save the whole day. So this whole best friends philosophy is not about just being nice, it's also a strategy. It's a strategy to turn those no's into a yes, it's a strategy to reduce behavior, a strategy to, to kind of connect these dots to make better things happen. So a couple quick thoughts uh, about kind of where we are professionally in the field now. Um, I'll say that language continues to evolve um, from the 80s and 90s where you had a lot of language that kind of focused on, focused on victimization. We had a, a very um, well-established phrase and, and, and concept of person-centered care by a guy named Tom Kitwood that basically we want to really focus on the person and building their strengths. I think that's evolving now to what I'd almost call relationship-centered care, to focus on, on relationship-centered care. Um, my, friend, uh, my friend Jonathan from Los Ventanas is here. They're gonna be opening up a memory care neighborhood at their CCRC uh, in January, and uh, they're actually gonna be calling their workers best friends to focus, again, on this idea of relationship. All right, uh, that's very, very healing and powerful. Um, this word care partner, uh, I'm kind of an old timer, sometimes I still use the word caregiver, but my intent is to switch to this phrase, care partner. And I've had people say to me, David, are you just being PC? I mean, what is this business of caregiver versus care partner? Or, you know, I'm caring for my wife and it doesn't always feel like a partnership. You know, I'm, I'm struggling. Well, I just want to put this out there, that this idea of care partnership uh, helps you focus on the strengths versus the losses helps you being open to surprise, I think it's a very respectful mode, you're doing with, not always doing for, okay? And again, it doesn't have to be 50-50, but when you think, how can I partner with my husband? How can I partner with my mom? What can I still encourage her to do? Uh, if you're a staff member, again, traveling the journey with the person instead of doing four, 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 I think all of these things are very respectful, build dignity, and build success. The future. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff going out there in the world. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to Google this, if you haven't heard the phrase before, this idea of a dementia-friendly community where they're training bankers and lawyers and restaurant owners and trying to build awareness so that you know, in the future people with dementia will be more accepted. It'll almost be kind of a, a village, it takes a village approach to memory care. Um, uh, South Korea, uh, they're training right now, I think they've actually already trained 100,000 young people to be caregivers, to be care partners, to elders. And even in uh, England, they have a program called the Dementia Friends Initiative. I don't quite know how the numbers are working out, but their initial goal was to have a million volunteers who would adopt a neighbor or friend or family member to be uh, a best friend and to be supportive. Of, of a person with dementia. It's not based on my own best friend's philosophy, but I certainly heartily endorse it as well. I think providers are gonna have to step up their game. Our families are getting more and more sophisticated. They know a good program from a not so good program. Uh, I think programs are gonna be challenged to make sure that they're doing good staff training, that they have great activities, that they have some dementia capabilities. I think this is very good for the field. Years ago, I think you could open up any memory care program, it would instantly fill. Now people have choices. And as an advocate, even though I work as a consultant in the industry, as an advocate for people with dementia, I want, I want everyone to do their best. And, and again, I think all of this, even this one uh, picture from England here, about how they've created a therapeutic garden where people can sit and visit and talk. These are all examples of good programming. I will say with programming, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the people, it's the furniture and environment, it's, the, it's the, the activities. It's not just a beautiful building, it's also the people and the program. So it's, it's kind of those three key elements that help create success. Here's a picture of my late mother, Dorothy, in Paris in the 50s. I think she looks pretty nice. Uh, a message for families who are here today, learn all you can, how amazing that you've got great resources in Nevada, like the Alzheimer's Association and this, of course, incredible Cleveland Clinic. Uh, get your legal financial affairs in order, which I think most of us have, but remember that sometimes something happens to the healthy care partner before the person with dementia. And if you haven't gotten your affairs in order, it can be very, very costly. And then this third bullet I think is very essential. You know, sometimes even the best family care partners wait and wait and wait and wait to use services. 
I always encourage people not to fall into that trap because again, my, my, my bottom line here is that socialization is so powerful. It's good for the brain. The brain loves company. All of these things, I think, help. And if you begin to dip your toes into a day program, into in-home care, if you choose a, a progressive and good assisted living company, I think you'll find that that's actually a great gift to the person with dementia. And you don't want to have to make those decisions in an emergency. A couple final quotes here. Um, again, Dr. T Tom Kitwood. Caregivers are physicians of the human spirit. And I guess my, my, uh, my uh, name fell off of the slide somehow, but I love this quote from a dear friend of mine, Dr. Nori Graham in London, who was one of the founders of Alzheimer's Disease International. And she says that quality dementia care is ultimately all about informed love. So a final little plug for my own uh, body of work. I do have a website, bestfriendsapproach.com. And if you're on Facebook, you can also like Best Friends Approach. I send out a lot of different announcements and, and you know, interesting articles. Uh, uh, today, in fact, actually at noon, the exact same time I'm speaking, I was promoting a webinar uh, on dementia-friendly communities, actually free of charge coming out of England that I think will later be recorded that you can watch. So it's a great resource. And those are the various books I've written um, that are all available on Amazon or for my publisher. I do have with me, um, the Cleveland Clinic asked me to bring a few books. I do have the Dignified Life book, which is just a simple family guide, and I have my two activity books for sale today if anyone would like me to sign a book for them. Thank you very much for letting me be part of this amazing Lunch and Learn program, and I'd be happy if we have time to do a few questions. How are we doing? So I think we have about seven minutes, and there may even be some questions from the remote sites. Thank you for being here, but we'll start off with you, ma'am. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming. You're welcome. Great question. Um, she was asking about what's it like to take a trip with a person with dementia? Is that a good idea? How does it go? Everybody's a bit different. I will tell you, years ago, we were very overprotective. Oh, don't do that. Keep them in their very secure environment. What I always like to say to people is, you know, sometimes you have to take a trip, either to the doctor or maybe there's a, a really major family event. You want someone to attend, you know, go to a wedding or even a, a funeral. So I always say, um, if you are taking a trip, try to have a buddy with you, you know, have a backup person so it's not just you and the person. Sort of have a fallback plan, a plan B. Be prepared to make a change if things are not going well. So I'm kind of all in. If you could use common sense, get some help, give it a shot, okay? But a friend of mine took his dad to a baseball game. You know, his dad always loved baseball. He, he anguished about it. He finally went to the baseball game. He brought another friend with him. After about three or four innings, maybe after about an hour, an hour and a half, the dad was done. So they had to leave. But it really worked out, and, and my friend was so happy they at least had given it a shot. So, you know, do your best. Have some, have some extra help if you can. Uh, maybe take a little one-day trip first, see how it goes. What about a cruise? Well, I went on my first ever cruise about, gosh, 10 years ago with my mom and dad, and my mom actually had Alzheimer's during that point. She was fairly early, um, and they did really well. They did really well, the staff were helpful, and this particular cruise line, I was like the youngest person on the ship. <laughs> so there were a lot of people there, I was like, hmm, I'm not sure about that person. So, you know, I think that a cruise uh, can be very helpful because it's a self-contained uh, venue, and, and there's staff who will help. And, and I think, why not? Give it a shot, particularly if, you know, if there's some other family member who can go with you. Can, can I come? I'll, I'll be happy to come with you. Yeah, great. Yes? What about touch? I, I suspect it's, a, it's like the strong, dark coffee. Uh, we have a friend who has dementia, and I notice that my hug, if I hold the hug a little longer, there's a little milk that comes in that has to be mixed. Yeah. Instance. Uh, he was asking about touch, and you know, I think touch is very important, particularly in, in later stage dementia where things are tactile, you know, having the, the cat on the lap, having things to touch and hold, even like a, a, a nice, uh, 
you know, stuffed animal or teddy bear. Those can be very powerful. Um, I notice a lot of us who work in the field, I tend to be very touchy-feely and give lots of hugs and handshakes. I mean, you know, I always like to say give an invited or welcomed hug because not everybody likes them, you know. But, but also, if, if I'm working in memory care and you're there and I give you a hug, I'll know pretty fast. You know, if you freeze and get stressed, I'll know that you're just not one of those touchy people, right? But I think it's very powerful. And one of the things that, you know, we talk a lot about in quality dementia care is even this 30-second activities, giving a little hand massage, uh, you know, hey, hey, you know, George, can I give you a little neck rub? I think all of those are, are, are often very nice and very connecting. Yes? Sure. Um, her question was, are there any adult day programs in the Las Vegas area that are dementia specific because your husband had been asked to leave a couple where they, they were having trouble with his behaviors and you said that the staff, you noticed, were arguing with him and correcting. Unfortunately, not being a resident of Las Vegas, I don't know the answer to the question, but I'm sure someone here at the Cleveland Clinic can help you or the Alzheimer's Association. Many day programs around the country, particularly some of the social day programs, are dementia specific. So I would encourage you to, you know, do a little bit more digging in a big area like Vegas, there probably is. Uh, also, you know, maybe again, call some of the different home, home agencies, see if any of them have some good dementia training. Um, hopefully you could find the right person, but I'm sorry that that hasn't worked out for you. So she was saying that her experience was that the day program actually con confessed to her that they, their staff had no training in dementia. Well, let me just handle it this way. I, I will say that any program serving elders that doesn't have some basic training in dementia, they're opening themselves up to a world of hurt because you know, you know, the average, something like 30 to 40% of people over 85 have dementia, 15% of people over 65. So all I can say is I hope that they get with the program and, and will embrace some um, good dementia training because, uh, you know, we, it's an enormous issue and I'm sure that if their staff have had no training, it wouldn't just be with your husband, they'd have other issues too. Uh, I'm, I guess I'll ask if there are any questions from the remote areas. I don't know quite how they call those in or email them in, but maybe the staff can let me know. Okay. Yes. Ah. And my mom had Alzheimer's, and that's why I got into it. And I always try to look for things to put on there and just like little activities for them to do because, you know, you don't want to be childish, but you don't want to, you know, you have to be safe. So you have to be, I, I, what I do is I get stuffed animals, I get little, like, push button things that they can really So she was saying that her, her company makes activity aprons and you're looking for just little projects and things to do. I, I guess what I'd say is anything you can come up with that has more of a sense of purpose. You know, I, I have friends who will, you know, wrap yarn, um, people who will um, organize poker chips or card decks or organize scrapbooks. Um, I always love things that feel adult and feel purposeful. So anything you think of, organizing old recipe cards, uh, stamps, you know, colors, things like that. Um, a good resource, a friend of mine, Kathy Lauren Hugh, has a website called Wiser Now, and they have some good materials. There's Activity Connections, this online activity uh, organization that has great resources. Um, you can find some of these my activity books, but I think you know anything that you can think of little things to organize, sort, fold, all of that can be very powerful. I also love conversation starters, cards, all of that. 
How about one more question that I think our formal time is up. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, she was saying another online service, and I know the people behind it, and actually got an email from them this morning, I think, hippocampus.com, and they have other resources as well. Thank you all very much. Have a great day, and I'll be happy to visit with a few of you uh, afterwards, sign some books if you'd like. And again, thank you to my friends at Cleveland Clinic for this second invitation to be here. Thank you.